We're going to be talking about Job today. And I call this set of readings the creation of meaning. Hopefully, it will become clear why. Let's begin with a prayer. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O heavenly King, comforter, spirit of truth, everywhere present and filling all things, treasury of blessings and giver of life, come dwell within us, cleanse us of all stain, and save our souls, O good one. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, let's get to it. So first, the context of Job. Job is grouped under a group of biblical texts called wisdom literature. It's called wisdom literature primarily because these group of texts are associated with King Solomon, the son of King David, and Solomon is primarily known for his wisdom, for his sayings, for his reflections on human life and the human condition. These books include the book of Job, which we'll talk about today, the book of Psalms, attributed to David, but nevertheless still included under wisdom literature, the book of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Songs, the wisdom of Solomon, all of those last four being attributed to King Solomon himself in one way or another, and then finally the wisdom of Ben Sirah, sometimes called Sirach one of the books of the Bible, along with wisdom, that appear in Catholic Bibles, but not in Protestant Bibles or in Jewish versions of the Old Testament. Wisdom literature offers different questions, different answers to the question about the significance of human life and human action. And in particular, the books of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job offer different perspectives on the question, what is the significance of what I do? Do good actions have good effects? The book of Proverbs, for instance, would answer with a resounding yes. If you do well, if you do good, you will live well and happily. If you do evil, then bad things will happen to you. The book of Ecclesiastes takes a diametrically opposed view it's more of an existential work that questions the significance of anything, good or bad, that human beings do. Uh, it calls all human life and every action within a human life mere vapor. It usually is translated as vanity of vanities, all is vanity, but the Hebrew word hebel there just means vapor. Everything is just like a cloud of mist that just dissolves. So Ecclesiastes sort of uh, pushes the question of human significance to its farthest extent. The book of Job falls somewhere in between these. It questions the answer that Proverbs gives. Maybe there isn't a perfectly clean causal relationship between good actions and good effects, but perhaps human actions have significance and meaning nevertheless in the end. <clears throat> Do virtue and righteousness pay off? This is what we're going to be dealing with. This is a central theme in wisdom literature. And for Job in particular, the question is really, is God just? And does God order the world justly? So, very briefly, who is Job, the main character in this book? The first verse of the book calls him a blameless and upright man who feared God and avoided evil. So he's called righteous. Uh, he is, in a sense, a paradigmatic example of a good human being, someone for whom nothing bad should happen. He's did, he did everything well. He did everything rightly. According to the book of Proverbs, everything should go well for him. He's also described as being from this land of ooze or oots. We only find it in three places in the Bible. Its geographic location is a mystery. But the thing to remember about it is that it is not within Israel or Judah. It's not within Canaan. It's not part of the territory of the Israelite people. So here we are dealing with a man who is righteous, but nevertheless not an Israelite. And his friends and everybody in the story are non-Israelites. They are Gentiles. So that's important to how the story is framed. 
It's the Israelites telling a story about a righteous man who is not one of the chosen people. Okay, so let's set the scene a little bit. So we've already said Job is righteous. He's also loaded. He has more livestock than any other person in the East. He is richer, wealthier, more blessed than anybody in his immediate surroundings. So he is well off. And he also takes care of his own. The first chapter says that his children like to have feasts. He makes sure in case they have sinned in feasting that he atones for any potential sins they might have. So not only is he righteous, but he makes sure that he offers the sacrifices and prayers for those in his family so that no sin, this is what's important, no sin can be attributed to him or his family. He is in a sense an atom of this parallel non-Israelite world. He is in a setting of abundance, and he is righteous. So he has an upright relationship with God. Everything seems to be going well. He's in a world that seems to be made for him, and he does rightly, and things go well for him. But here comes the pain. We are transported to a heavenly scene where the Lord is entertaining divine or angelic visitors. And one of these visitors is called the Satan, which is, of course, where we get the title Satan from. But the original Hebrew here is a, is, is a title. It's not a name. So it's not a guy or an angel named Satan. It is the accuser. That's what Satan means, the accuser. So don't think of the devil with horns, a pitchfork, and a forked tail. Think of more like Al Pacino in The Devil's Advocate, a crafty interrogator who is trying to challenge God and to push back on God's own claims that here we have a truly righteous human being in the world. The Satan says, well, maybe he's not so good as you think he is. Maybe he's not quite as righteous as you claim him to be. Let's test it. So the Satan proposes a test for Job because he says, Job blesses you because you bless him. Of course, he's going to honor you if you give him all this stuff. But if you curse him, we'll see what happens. I think he'll curse you in return for your own uh, allowing of misfortunes in his life. So the Lord allows the Satan to mess with Job. First, all of Job's animals are taken away or killed. Then all of Job's children are killed when uh, a storm comes and collapses the house where they're in. And Job's initial response is encouraging. It seems to vindicate the Lord's own perspective on Job. Job says, the Lord gives, the Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. I'll accept God's blessings. I'll accept the misfortunes that come from him. And so Job passes this first test. But then the Satan op ups the ante. The Lord allows the Satan to strike Job with severe boils from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. So now we're not only cursing Job's property and his family, these things that belong to Job, but we're also cursing Job himself. We're allowing a misfortune to afflict him in his own body. And here's where Job begins to struggle. So Job's content begins with his wife, who in a sense is kind of an Eve figure. If you read between the lines, Eve in Genesis, as we'll see, tempts Adam to break his relationship with God. Similarly, Job's wife says, you know what you should do, Job? Curse God and die. Are you still hanging around? Are you still claiming to be innocent? Just go ahead and curse God and die. Helpful advice. Probably hasn't had too many counseling classes, Job's wife. But Job refuses. Job says, no, no, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to give up. I have a few things to say before I exit the stage. And it's at this point that Job's friends arrive. You have Eliphaz from Teman, Bildad from Shu, Zophar from Nama, 
So these are all non-Israelites and they are representatives of wise, learned people. So they're all kind of representatives of different cultures in that area that each have their own wisdom tradition. So here we have the best that the East has to offer to respond to Job. And they get off to a good start. They show concern, so they come to Job. When they see Job in his state, they break down and weep, so they have compassion. And they offer Job their mere presence for seven days. They just sit there with them, which is perhaps the best thing one can do in this situation. But after seven days of silence, Job begins to speak. He issues his complaint. Perish the day on which I was born, he says, the night when they said the child is a boy. May that day be darkness. Why did I not die at birth, come forth from the womb and expire, Job writes, or says. Why is light given to the toilers, he goes on to say. Life to the bitter in spirit. They wait for death and it does not come. They search for it, rejoice in it. So it's getting darker. Job is, in a sense, wishing for oblivion. He's wishing that he had never existed at all. And more than that, he wants to be hidden from God. He wants to be hidden from everything. He wants to just simply forget and fade into oblivion. And it's then at this point that Job's friends respond to Job's complaint. The bulk of Job is one long debate, chapters 4 through 37 out of the 42, are Job debating with his friends. And I've made this little paraphrase of their debate, which covers all of these 34 chapters of dense Hebrew poetry. It goes something like this. Job says, this affliction's an outrage. It's completely unfair. Calls everything into question. WTF, God. And his friends respond, but God is just. He governs the world justly. Therefore, your suffering must be just. You must have done something to warrant it. You must have done something wrong. Very logical, you know, premise, premise, conclusion. Job will have none of it, though. Ah, no, you don't understand. There's nothing that I could possibly have done to deserve this. The only thing worse than suffering is knowing that God allowed it. Maybe having friends like you. If only I could just forget God and he forget me. But his friends keep pushing. They even suggest sins that he might have committed to deserve the suffering. Oh, maybe you did this, or maybe you did that. Maybe you don't even know what you did. Maybe you did something and don't know you did it. But Job then responds, why would God punish me without letting me know why? Why would I have to endure the suffering and not know why? Why doesn't God himself come and tell me what, what I did? Again, it's totally unfair. So here you have a situation where a righteous person who knows he's righteous, and it's true that he's righteous, is enduring severe suffering. And this is why Father Bartholomew calls it a kind of paleontology of revelation. Job is Israel's way of speculating about the relationship between God and a righteous man who knows nothing of revelation. So all he knows is that God exists and that there's some relationship between what he does and what God gives him in return. And Israel's thinking about this in the wake of their own great communal trauma, the Babylonian exile. They seemed to be in a good place, and then the Babylonians came and took them into exile. So why? How would a good person respond to this sort of misfortune if all they knew about God was just drawn from their experience of the natural world? That's really what Job is really about. So it's about a human person before God speaks to humanity trying to grapple with the suffering of the innocent. Job depicts humanity's relationship to God before revelation. So it's about the universal human condition we all share. And it can then serve as a way for Israel to rethink its assumptions about how God deals with the world. Bartholomew goes even further, though, and talks about the tragic or paradoxical condition of humanity. Our curse is that we are aware of ourselves and we want to know the relationship between ourselves and the world around us. We want to know the significance of our actions. All creatures suffer, it's true, but we're the only ones who ask why. Why do we suffer? So our suffering can never just be a brute fact about the world. It has to have some meaning. Inevitably, we ask for some explanation for it. 
And if there is no explanation, if suffering is pointless, then everything is pointless. Because if one thing matters, pain matters, right? You could say, ah, oh, everything is just meaningless. But then when you're in pain, at least one thing in your world matters, namely that you're in pain and that you need to get out of it. So similarly, Job can never get rid of God because he can't get rid of this need for explanation and meaning because he's a human being. Uh, he wants to know why, and he's aware of himself wanting to know why. You could say, well, everything is pointless, but if you really believe that, you wouldn't even bother to say it, right? There'd be no point in saying it, because saying it would also be pointless. So Job can't make sense of what God's done, but he also can't escape the human need to make some sense of it. This is his dilemma, according to Father Bartholomew. His questions have no answers, but he can't put them out of his mind. So he cries out to God. He lashes out at God. And it's at this point that God intervenes. The dude shows up, as Father Boyle would say. God shows up and answers Job out of the storm. And the Hebrew word here is whirlwind. So you might even think of it as a hurricane. God shows up in a dramatic display. And he asks Job, well, who are you? And where were you when I made the world? He asks these rhetorical questions to put Job in his place. He's giving Job here in chapters 38 to 41, not so much an answer, but a change in perspective. He's saying to Job, you know what, Job? You're part of something much bigger than yourself, something you did not design or make. It's a world upon which you depend, but that doesn't depend upon you. So if you notice all the animals that are described in this section, are animals that really have no direct relationship to uh, human life. They're not the animals that Job had as livestock. They're not domesticated animals. They're wild animals. They're part of the natural world that is bigger than the human world. God asks Job, who is this who darkens counsel with words of ignorance? One of the more famous verses from Job. Have you comprehended the breadth of the earth? Tell me. If you know it all, God tells Job. So God is not exactly happy with Job here. He's asking him these rhetorical questions and just kind of beating him down with them until Job finally recognizes that he's spoken out of place. And Job finally says, look, I'm of little account. What can I answer you? But God hasn't had enough. God then goes in and describes these two strange, huge, fearsome creatures, the behemoth, which I think of like a rhinoceros or, or a hippo, a land creature, and Leviathan, this massive sea creature, like a sea monster. And the point of these chapters after Job's initial response is God is basically saying, look, the world is weird, complex, it's dangerous, but nevertheless good. I've made all of these things in it, and I know what I'm doing. And Job finally then relents and says, I know that you can do all things. I've spoken, but did not understand things too marvelous for me, which I did not know. I repent. So the aftermath is basically that God pronounces a verdict on the friends. To Eliphaz, he says, my anger blazes against you and your two friends. You've not spoken rightly concerning me as my servant Job has. Well, why would that be the case? He also says, have Job pray for you, which is weird because he's just got through reaming Job. And so now Job uh, is going to intercede on behalf of these friends so that God's wrath doesn't come upon them. What we're dealing here with is two wrong views of God, but two unequally wrong views of God. The friends have spoken wrongly about God because they presume to understand him. To them, he was like a vending machine. Put in good works, and God dispenses blessings. They're treating God like a machine, like a what, not a who. Job treats God like someone on the same level as himself, which is bad, but at least he speaks to him as being capable of a response, a personal response. So what can we glean from this? Well, maybe it's better to rail at God than to ignore him. Job's cries are at least moments in an ongoing relationship, turbulent, but a relationship nonetheless. So then the Lord restores Job's wealth and family twofold. So Job ends up with twice as much as he had before. And I think this is of less consequence to the story than what the story really tells us about 
suffering and about uh, going on amidst suffering, maintaining this relationship with God even in the midst of suffering. It's about finding a way to go on. It's, in other words, about hope. So Job's friends presume to have everything figured out. For them, God is just a variable in an equation. So they can deal with God like any other natural force, right? They can even maybe manipulate God. God becomes a function of their interests. And so they're afflicted with the vice of presumption. That's their, their problem. Job, on the other hand, is tempted to despair. He wishes he could just fade into oblivion, but he can't. Yet he continues to cry out. He never lets the matter go. So God responds to his petulant resistance, yes, with a rebuke, but more importantly, with a display of his own power and wisdom. God answers Job not with ideas, but with his own presence. So it's true. God doesn't really answer Job's questions. He doesn't give him an explanation. But he gives him, rather, a way to live with his own questions, a way to go on. And that's what hope is. Neither giving up on the journey, despair, nor pretending you're already at the destination, which is presumption. Hope is a way to keep going, a way to continue to live and to relate to God in the world, even amidst affliction and hardship. Okay, that's it for today, and I will see you guys on Monday.